Okay, this is a section today that I don't like to cover. Uh, the Catholic Inquisition takes place for a long, long time, uh, about 700 years really, but that, that is just the actual Catholic Inquisition. Um, the uh, persecution against Christians has been going on for 2,000 years, but the Catholic Inquisition itself uh, was the time period of about only about 700 years. And uh, so we've talked already about some persecutions that came out against, obviously, early Christians, came out against the early Christians in the uh, 1, 2, 300 A.D. by the Romans, by the pagan governments coming in and persecuting Christianity. Of course, uh, under Constantine, it changed a bit that now the Christianity was not the persecuted ones anymore in the sense that uh, uh, the Roman government was persecuting them. But what really switched even then in 323 AD was that true Christians continued to be persecuted by Constantine um, and by the, what became then the Catholic Church. And um, so over the many centuries, even before the actual Inquisition, true Christians have always suffered at the hands of unbelievers. Um, in, in the name of God. That's, all, that's always been the case. So don't, don't misunderstand when we say this, the Catholic Inquisition. Don't think, oh, that meant that during that time there was persecution, but the rest of the of history, there hasn't been persecution against Christians. Oh no, there's always been strong persecution against Christians. But the main persecution by the Catholics took place about 1,000 to 1,700. I'm on page 146. Um, so we're going to look at this uh, section. I'm not going to read to you a, a lot of things. I, I think it's very good for all of you to read through this section. Um, I think it's very good now because I teach it and so every year this I'm, I'm you know kind of washed over this stuff washes over me again and I'm, I'm I've read it enough times <laughs> um, so I won't read too much I will touch on some of the different persecutions different methods that they employed but um, but I think, I really believe that all of you should read this and that it should occasionally, every several years or something like this at least, that you ought to think about these kinds of things. Uh, what Christians have gone through for the cause of Christ. And uh, it is a challenge. Man, is it a challenge for me to think about, uh, you know, just what they were willing to give up. What true Christians, and a lot of times, that, like in the Catholic Inquisition, it wasn't even the Christians that were being... It was anybody who the Catholics wanted to, you know, carry out their vengeance upon. So it, it, oftentimes it was Catholics that were being tortured and falsely accused and so on. But still, as far as Christians, true Christians, uh, the things that they suffered is just unspeakable. Um, just horrible things. Women, children... Um, just awful, awful things. So, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to read too many details in class. I don't like to do that. But uh, there are some things that we do need to point out at the beginning, and that kind of set the stage for the uh, Inquisition, the persecution itself. So let's pray, and we'll get started on page 146. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Help us to be... Uh, aware of these things, what uh, godly people, godly Christians suffered for you. Lord, we know that according to your word, they have a crown waiting for them in heaven. And they're there now, but uh, they'll receive a crown someday, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. Lord, I'm sure that all of them would say it was worth it. It was worth it. Help us to be challenged by this. Help us to truly believe in you enough that we would give our lives for you. And we thank you for this uh, lesson that we have today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. During the first few centuries after the apostles, secular governments and pagan religions were the instruments of choice to torment God's people. By the fourth century, 
it became, started to become the church <laughs> that was persecuting and tormenting God's people. The Roman Catholic Church had begun to usurp authority over other churches and was persecuting those who refused to submit to its claims. So there's a couple points here on page 146 and 147 where the idea of persecuting those who don't agree with you, where that comes from in the writings of some of the church fathers of the Catholic Church. Constantine, number two, laid the foundation for the Inquisition when he brought the church together with the state, giving the church the authority of the state. That's a bad move. Um, in, in the old, notice again, think about this. This is a, com, a combining of Old Testament law to the New Testament church, right? You under, do you understand that concept that uh, they're, they're seeing the church in the light as if it was Israel of the Old Testament, right? In Israel in the Old Testament, uh, Moses had uh, someone, a man and a woman, killed for breaking the Sabbath day. Well, in the New Testament church age, it's the government that puts people to death. And so uh, Romans chapter 13 is there very clear that it's not the uh, church's responsibility. Uh, it's not our responsibility to go out and find people that we disagree with, find wicked sinners and put them to death. That's not our responsibility. Um, Paul submitted himself to the government. Jesus submitted himself to the government. He allowed the government to do its job, even when it was killing him. Same with Paul. But anyway, so the, the Catholic Church sees them as themselves as the Old Testament church, if you will. And that, of course, was set up by Constantine combining the church and the state. Also, Augustine, he is very, we've talked about this already. He was very instrumental in getting this teaching, this understanding in the Catholic Church of uh, uh, persecuting those you disagree with. Luke 14, 23 talks about the idea of compelling them to come in. They use that verse. You force them to come into the, they say that's the church, the kingdom uh, in, in the parable that's used. Anyway, so Luke 14, 23 is a verse that uh, is very well used by them um, to bring about this idea. <clears throat> Before the actual Inquisition itself, there were a number of popes, and this book lists out seven, seven of them at least. Actually, there's a bunch more there in, on letter B. But many of the popes persecuted those who they disagreed with. Um, there's... Uh, well, anyway, so uh, a lot of them felt that it was right and it was okay to persecute. And so they did. They persecuted the Waldenses. They persecuted uh, many of these little groups of Bible believers, but not in a systematic way like the Inquisition was. Um, Peter Waldo is talked about on top of page 149. They persecuted Peter Waldo and his followers, any who refused to accept Catholic doctrine. Remember one of their reasons for persecuting those who didn't baptize infants. Why did they do that? Why would you persecute those who don't agree with you on infant baptism? Yes, Caleb, that Caleb Barrera. Because to the Catholics, it was like condemning a baby to hell. Sure, so you're condemning a baby to hell, so you deserve to be persecuted. Um... Different church councils, not just the popes, but church councils, okayed the idea of persecuting. Um, they gave permission to princes to reduce heretics to slavery. And for those who would take up arms against these heretics to reduce their time of penance. <laughs> uh, we'll take away some years of purgatory off of your, uh, your suffering if you'll persecute Bible believers. Um, Pope Lucius III placed anathema upon all who refused to obey his doctrines. He said, We declare all Puritans, Paterines, 
poor of lions, etc., to lie under a perpetual curse for teaching baptism and the Lord's Supper otherwise than the Church of Rome. Wow. So they literally persecuted those who disagreed with them in doctrine. What did Paul say about that? What did Paul say about those who disagree in doctrine? Isn't Paul the leader uh, of the church in a large... He's the apostle to the church. Paul gave many, many teachings concerning the church. What did he say about those who are disagreeing with you, disagreeing with you doctrinally? Kill them? Um... <laughs> okay, there's a place for that. I think of uh, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You said church discipline? Church discipline, absolutely. Mark them which cause divisions, offenses contrary, contrary to the doctrine which you have heard, and avoid them. Never talks about going to kill them or tormenting them. I mean, it's just, it's, it's out of control when you think about what the Catholic Church is responsible for. Okay, so the Roman Catholic Inquisition was at work for hundreds of years, in, that, in a sense, before the actual Inquisition started. Okay? Now, go to page 150. Here's, here's where you see really the beginning of the actual Inquisition. Pope, not so innocent, Pope Innocent III. Pope not so innocent the third. 1198 to 1216. It was during his reign that the fearful Roman Catholic Inquisition assumed a more organized, systematic fashion. Now, not just in this book, but you've got to read about Innocent the Third. Uh, he was a very proud, proud <clears throat> picture of Jesus Christ on earth. Because that's what the Pope is, right? Uh, he's, he is a substitute for, uh, for God on the earth. Uh, and a very proud man. He wanted to force his will upon everyone. He forbade the people to read the Bible in their own language. They that, oh, I'm sorry, they shall be seized for trial and penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes. Okay, so what did Innocent do? Uh, he, he used the Bible to make his point. Okay, somebody look up. Uh, actually, I don't have the passage here. Oh, no, he doesn't actually use the passage. In uh, Schaff's History of the Christian Church, he makes this reference. I have a uh, set of those volumes, and I looked it up, and I've read this before in, in those uh, books as well. Um, Innocent's, uh, Pope Innocent, his Bible story that he used was the story of the uh, situation at Mount Sinai, when God was going to come down on top of the mountain, and Moses was instructed not to let any of the animals get close to the to the mountain itself. And so if any animal or if any man touched the mountain that he was supposed to be, he would be killed. And his picture that he was trying to draw here was that that, that mountain is like a picture of the Word of God. And not just anybody is allowed to go on to that mountain. Only Moses was allowed to go on to that mountain. Anybody else was not supposed to touch the mountain. So you say, what in the world is he saying? What, so what he's saying is, anybody who's not supervised, anybody who's, who doesn't have the proper credentials, Catholic priest, Catholic pope, anybody who doesn't have the proper credentials is not allowed to touch the Word of God. So all you commoners, you have no business reading it. You just listen to what we tell you it says. I mean, isn't that crazy? A ridiculous story to use as a picture here of the commoner not being allowed to read the Word of God. I could give you about 500 other verses that talk about how we should take the Word of God and hide it in our hearts. You know, was that written only to, uh, you know, to David the king? 
No, everybody. Uh, and on and on. I mean, he just... So, innocent declared that as by the old law, this is how Shaft writes it, the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death. So simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. That's the other aspect of it. Not only were, they, were the common person not allowed to touch the Word of God and, and, and you know, invade the space right, of God, as if that's the case, but they also weren't allowed to preach His doctrines. That reasoning was used for those who didn't have a license to preach that they weren't allowed to preach who's a famous preacher who went against that teaching and preached anyway. And he was put in prison for it. Bunyan, Bunyan thank you. John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress. He didn't get a license to preach, but he preached anyway, and the Catholic Church persecuted him for that because he, didn't ha he wasn't approved. You're not on the approved list. Okay? All right, Innocent III, he persecuted the uh, Waldensians in all places. Why? Because they took the liberty to read the scripture translated by Peter Waldo into the vulgar tongue. All right, so I side with the heretics on this one. Pope Innocent III expanded the Inquisition. Pope Gregory IX, he's also called Pope Gregory the Great. He then also further expanded the Inquisition. He was the nephew of Innocent III. And uh, he, he spread the uh, torture and so on, the Inquisition, into all Catholic countries. He, it's known that he, sounds terrible, but he fine-tuned the art of the Inquisition. The art of torture. He uh, appointed two groups of inquisitors, the Dominicans and the Franciscans. <laughs> In our day, if someone is a part of the Franciscan group, that's health care. <laughs> I guess they're trying to atone for all their past actions. It cracks me up. Uh, the hospital in Michigan City, St. Anthony's, is a member of the Franciscan uh, network, um, as if they were this loving, kind uh, group of people trying to help people with their health care. Yeah, they're, they, what they did is they went around finding Christians for the Catholic Church to persecute, secretly infiltrating communities, trying to rat out Christians and then persecute them. Sounds like real nice people, right? It's like the CIA of the Catholic Church. <laughs> he said uh, to these groups that if Pope Gregory the Ninth, that if any person died in the attempt to catch the, capture the Pope's enemies, the Pope would grant a full pardon of all their sins. <laughs> yeah, we'll forgive you completely. All right, now these these inquisitors. Uh, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Um, and there are other groups like them. Anybody know of some other groups also who uh, went around persecuting, infiltrating? I, I've read uh, lots of these long, big chick tracks. They're not the little ones. They're the big books. And they talk about some of the history of the Catholic Church. And I don't know how... I, I'm sure that some of that gets into conspiracy theory and so on. But um, most of it, I, I, I'm convinced is true as far as uh, there were lots of groups who uh, infiltrated and exposed uh, true Bible believers for the Catholic Church to persecute. Anyway, um, on page 152, uh, there's a list there of some of the things that they did um, for these two groups primarily to try to infiltrate and try to uh, catch Christians. They said that all public officials were obligated to give whatever assistance was required. Public officials, that's government officials, 
the, uh, the kings and secular authorities were ordered to root out and destroy Waldenses and separatist Christians. Um, there were uh, many town and local officials who didn't have one bit of a problem with the Christians that lived there. The Waldenses didn't have a problem with them. But the Catholic Pope came in and said, you're going to turn over these people or we're going to get you. And so they would turn them over many times. Any laws that hindered the Inquisition could be abrogated, shut down, simply because the Pope said so. Not even a papal legate or ambassador could interfere with the work of the Inquisitors. All citizens from ages 12 to 14 and older were sworn as spies of the Inquisition, required to reveal all offenders. Inquisitors could gather all the citizens together at the sound of a bell any time they pleased. They set up their own fearful prisons and could torture and punish the heretics. Those who were caught by the Inquisition had no legal recourse, were entirely at the mercy of the cruel Inquisitors. No legal recourse. There's no such thing as trial by jury. There's no such thing as uh, you know, knowing your accusers, etc. That, that was completely foreign. The person who was caught didn't even have the right to confront his accuser or even to know who the accuser was or what they said. Imagine that. We're going to see this in a little bit here. Uh, the, the midnight knock on the door. Everyone learned to fear that midnight knock on the door. Uh, come with us. Somebody has accused you of you name it. Oh, that was the last time you're going to be at home. Say goodbye. That was it. Um, it, happened to, it happened to every level, every class, every walk of life. Uh, from the rich to the... In fact, if you were rich, there's a, a better chance that you were going to be outed as a Christian or outed as, as a believer in something that you many times had no idea what they were talking about. Um, the Catholic Church took over massive amounts of land and wealth through the Inquisition. They just took it. Kill the owners, take the land, gain your wealth. Uh, it happened constantly for hundreds and hundreds of years, which, by the way, uh, you know, it just to me seems so unfair. You know, it's just not right. But uh, th th they'll reap their reward forever. If someone attempted to come to the aid of one who was in the hands of the inquisitors, he too became the object of persecution. Immediately executed, oh, I'm sorry, excommunicated, not executed, and could be charged with heresy and then executed. No matter how powerful anyone could be charged with heresy at the whim of the inquisitors. You believe this? Admit it. We're going to torture you until you do admit it. Doesn't that seem crazy? You know, anybody who's tortured long enough, probably eventually is going to admit something. And now we have reason to kill you. Ugh, just awful. Even Roman Catholics, letter N, were arrested by the Inquisition on the slightest suspicion of individual thinking. They might be suspected of holding, suspected of holding liberal opinions or may have shown in conversation that he knew more of theology than the illiterate monks so they turn him in. Um, in uh, Cambodia in the late 1970s, uh, ethnic cleansing was going on by Pol Pot, a horrible killer dictator. And um, anyone, he wanted to remove any opposition to himself and to the government. So the only people that could even be allowed to live were those who were poor and who were uneducated. So think about that. So they literally, they would arrest people who wore glasses because that meant you probably were educated, you probably read. Anybody who had any kind of education, they would go through the records, who was a doctor, lawyer, just go through the records, 
And everybody, of course, was trying to pretend, they figured that out, the common people, everybody figured that out. So they tried to change their names, they tried to change their identity and change their looks so that they couldn't be recognized as the doctor who used to work in town. Come with us. We have something to show you in the middle of the night. And that was the end of them. So this, this thinking here, and this is exactly what was going on in the Catholics, they just squashed completely squashed any kind of disagreement, any kind of opposition, to the point where they created this unbelievable climate of fear for hundreds of years. And the only way to, to survive was to, uh, you know, brown nose, to over the top brag on the Catholic Church and to be in full agreement with the Catholic Church. It was very difficult to escape the Inquisition. It spread everywhere. You see a listing of the countries on page 153. Some of the countries spread to the colonies all over the place. It was very difficult to escape this Inquisition. Um, all secular authorities were required to be on alert at all times for the heretics. So they kept... Uh, records and they shared records. Uh, anytime there were foreigners traveling, they were very suspicious of foreigners. Why are you traveling? Why would you be here? It's kind of like, uh, you know, the Catholic, no, I'm sorry, the communist countries of the, all through the 1900s in the Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, everybody's suspicious of each other and everybody is fearful of the government and uh, there's no recourse if you're caught, do, you know, supposedly doing something, whatever. Uh, priests in every town were at the disposal of the inquisitors. Spies were everywhere. Okay, so it's very difficult to escape the Inquisition. Okay, now on page 154... Uh, begins a section uh, called the application of torture. And I just want to, I just want to kind of touch on a few of them. I don't want to read any of the stories of people who actually suffered by these tortures. But, um, but you should. And I think it'd be good sometime after class if you uh, went through and read some more of the details of that. Um, Torture by the church, by at the command of the, su the uh, substitute for God on earth. Wow. Some of the typical methods described were <clears throat> one of the most common, as we have read, and there's many, many examples of this in uh, different writings on the uh, martyrdoms. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a uh, a very reliable source for these things. The torture by the rack was a common one here. Um, and you can see there in the picture, uh, they would literally just take the legs, tie them to one end, tie the arms to another uh, rolling post, if you will, and then they would just crank that post out and stretch the person out. And pop uh, bones and so on out of the sockets. Um, they, then they would leave them on here for hours and hours at a time, men, women, children. Um, horrible, horrible pain inflicted upon people. Uh, the pulley, that's another uh, process. If you're looking at that picture, it's the, the person in the top right corner. Take the arms behind the person, tie the arms together, and then put them on a rope and lift them in the air with their arms behind them and then tie a hundred pound weight to their feet to where it just pop those bones out of the shoulder sockets. And then whip them. They'd be naked. They would whip them and they would uh, demand that they give the names of other people they knew who were also uh, of this false doctrine or whatever it might be. And a lot of times they wouldn't have any other names. So before long, they start making up names. And if they didn't give the information they wanted, 
they drop the rope till right before they hit the ground, and of course that would immediately pop them out. Pulley torture. Water torture, causing them to swallow seven pints, and they had all these things, you know, down to a science, really. Forcing them to drink a lot of water, and it gave them the, the feeling of being drowned. Uh, fire, torture by fire, and that's not just talking about the burning at the stake, but that's talking about where they would seat them at the stocks. And they would tie them down, and then they would rub their bare feet in lard, and then burn it, light it on fire, and burn their feet. And a lot of times this was done to get children to confess about their parents supposedly doing things. And so even when children went through this, uh, even if they survived it, uh, many times they could never walk again uh, because of the torture. And there's a couple awful ones. The cat's paw and the heretic's fork. You'll have to read about those. Those are awful. The prison cells. People were uh, often, prisoners were often naked and put in cold prison cells and obviously just filthy, never cleaned, um, very poor food, uh, very little medical treatment, if any. Um, awful, awful things that these people went through. Um, just, just the despicable things that were done to, uh, to these people. Page 160 and 161 then discuss the, uh, the act of faith is the meaning there. And that is about the uh, burning at the stake the burning at the stake, and how many great men of God and women of God were, uh, were, you know, saw their last day on earth being burned at the stake uh, and then brought into the presence of God. Um, as I mentioned in my prayer, I'm convinced that every one of these people, obviously, uh, that is in heaven now would admit and it would say that that was worth it. Uh, what God did for them and that the fact that God allowed them to suffer for His name, that He's worthy. He's worthy. And I feel, I feel sometimes, you know, like here in America and our world that we live in, uh, we don't get persecuted for our faith. You know, we, we have some laws in our country that we don't like. You know, like onions. Can't sell onions. But... You know, we, in, by comparison, we have unbelievable freedom. And uh, there are still many Christians around the world who, don't, who do not have this freedom. And people who are being persecuted for their faith by the millions. People who die for their faith by the millions in the world that we live in. But this uh, coming at the hands of so-called Christianity, <laughs> uh, that's, that's what's unbelievable. Look on page 162. This is a good story here. 1559, King Philip of Spain, the popish husband of bloody Queen Mary, was witnessing one of these cruel scenes. There was a Protestant nobleman named Don Carlos de Ceso being conducted to the stake to be burned. And he called out to the king for mercy. He said, And canst thou, O king, witness the torments of thy subjects? Save us from this cruel death. We do not deserve it. No, replied the iron-hearted, bigoted monarch. I would myself carry wood to burn my own son were he such a wretch as thou. That was the common thinking. That was the common thinking. Uh, you deserve it. You don't uh, get in line with the system. You challenge the system, you're going to pay for it. Page 163 talks about the fearful midnight knock. And again, just horrific things here. All right, page 165. I can't read. You, uh, you need to. Gentle women <clears throat> being tortured. Read that paragraph, uh, several paragraphs on page 165 and 166. Um, just horrific. I want to read that after class. One other method of torment that was 
common was to sell people into slavery and uh, sentence them to the galley ships, the slave ships. And of course, on those ships, you know, it's just a slow death is really what that was. Uh, beatings, brutal treatment, lack of food, hard work. Um, and then when they were uh, done with them, when, when they had gotten all they could get out of them, they disposed of them, threw them overboard. So uh, just an awful, awful situation for Christians. Can you imagine being a Christian, trying to keep your faith, believing in God and trusting in the Lord, trying to keep your faith at a time like this. Uh, that's, I just I have a hard time comprehending that. You know, it'd be hard enough to be Job and have things happen to you like he had experience. But to have these kinds of torments uh, brought upon your body and then to keep your faith in God, that God is still in control, that God knows what he's doing, and that God is still good. Boy, that'd be hard. So uh, I'm challenged. I'm challenged by the faith that these believers showed. I'm challenged by the faith that people like John Bunyan, who sat in a prison, and instead of sitting, I'm sure it was an old, dirty, or cold, dark prison, and even though he was in prison, he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress and The Holy War. He, he didn't just sit there and feel sorry for himself. Uh, he left us amazing things. And there's many, many, many people like that. Um, how many thousands, how many tens of thousands, I'm sure millions of people whose names are not even known to history. And uh, God knows them. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, it doesn't mention them by name, but Hebrews 11 references them. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 uh, this great cloud of witnesses. Uh, they're encouraging us right now. They're watching us live our lives. And I'm sure that many of uh, their fellow martyrs and Christians on earth who are suffering persecution, they're especially rooting for them to maintain the faith, to believe in God, to trust in God, even though uh, all these terrible things are happening to them. So, all right, that's the Catholic Inquisition. Awful, horrible things. Ask a Catholic about that today. Read Catholic writings about this. You know what they'll say? We didn't do that. We didn't do that. That wasn't us. It wasn't, we didn't put people to death. How can, say, how can they say that? because they torture them to the point of death, and then they turn them over to the local government and let the local government burn them at the stake. So it wasn't technically the Catholic Church killing these people because they didn't actually carry the firebrand to the, to the pile of faggots. So, so they can say they didn't do it. Well. Number one, they, that's not true. They are responsible for it because they obviously were in charge of the, of, the, of the local governments. But number two, that also totally ignores the fact that unspeakable number of people were actually killed in their hands, you know, on the rack, um, in their prison cells before they could be taken out and burned at the stake. So... On two accounts, that is very, uh, oh, how would you say? <laughs> you know, it's a huge lie. It's, a, it's a very deceptive. Uh, yes, they were responsible for those deaths, whether they actually lit the fire or not. And the other thing is that all those people who actually did die in their hands, that there's no record of. There's no record of them. But everybody talked about it. Everybody knew that it was happening. People disappeared and were never burned at the stake. Where did they go? Somebody, somebody put them to death. But you read Catholic websites, you read Catholic uh, history books, our Catholic encyclopedias. Yeah, they, they disposed of those heretics. They, they removed them. No, it doesn't say how they did it. 
but uh, it was by the methods that we talked about today. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll pick up next class period with the Bible in the Middle Ages, a more, more uh, regular, normal topic here.